Good afternoon, friends. I'm so glad to see you here today in the five o'clock hour. I am the Reverend Terry Peterson, Minister of St. John's in Gurik, and I'm coming to you today with sparkling water and the word um, because I'm hoping to get a run in this afternoon or evening if it doesn't start pouring with rain again. So I'll have my wine afterwards. I hope that you are ready to transition from one part of the day to the next and that you have something to mark that with and that you maybe have your Bible ready because we've got a lot of things to talk about today. But first, some community building. Let us take a moment to just share our lives with one another um, with the high points and low points. And I have to report to you that yesterday when I said the high point of my day was still to come, because there was to be a session meeting in the evening on Zoom. I was 100% right about that. It was a fantastic evening meeting the elders on Zoom and I was so pleased to see them all and be able to chat together and to talk about some things. So that was great. Today's high point is that I have baked some bread with a new type of flour and I think it worked. I haven't cut it yet because it's still cooling, but I'm pretty sure that even though it didn't fluff up over the top of the loaf pan, I think that it smells amazing for one thing. So even if it's smaller pieces, it will still be delicious, I'm pretty sure. So that's exciting. My experiment on that seems to have worked much better than my cake from last week. Um, the low point of my day <laughs> might be running in the rain in a little while. I hope it does not rain because I really dislike running in the rain, even though I live in Scotland. Like I just really, especially if it starts raining when I'm outside, I don't love it. And on a day when I have my glasses instead of contacts, everything about that is terrible. So hopefully that will not be the case, but I have a suspicion that later I am about to get very wet. That will definitely be the low point of my day, but I'll report back tomorrow and let you know. So I hope you have someone to share your life with, even in the mundane details. It matters that we are connected together in this way. It helps us build up the body of Christ. So share your life with someone, high points and low points whether that's on the phone or in person or by message to me, whatever it takes. Um, today, I want for us to pick up a little bit more of the story of Moses. So yesterday we heard about um, Moses being placed in this ark, this wicker ark, and floated on the banks of the Nile, and then found by Pharaoh's daughter and adopted by this princess. So her father had insisted that babies like Moses be killed, and instead she adopted him, made him her own son, bringing this Hebrew child that her father wanted killed into the family instead. And we talked about her bravery in drawing him out of the water and standing up to her dad about that. So today we're going to move on to chapter seven, of the book of Exodus, and a lot happens in between. So Moses's young adulthood is very eventful, and I recommend going and reading those in-between bits about what happens to him and how he has some very major um, mistakes, shall we say. He gets into some trouble. He does some wrong things. He ends up out in the wilderness and he has a family there and then he meets God in the burning bush. He comes back to Egypt and attempts to help the Israelites get free from slavery. Moses has an older brother and an older sister. We met his older sister in the incident in the river. Uh, he also has a brother who's three years older than he is called Aaron. So Moses is the baby of the family. And Moses and Aaron are the ones who are going to feature heavily in this story with Pharaoh. So today we're going to pick up at the point when uh, the plagues begin. So prior to this, Moses and Aaron had gone to Pharaoh to speak to him and to ask him to let the people go out into the wilderness to worship. And Pharaoh has 
declined that opportunity despite some signs and wonders that Aaron has managed to perform because the magicians who work in Pharaoh's court are also able to turn their staff into a snake and whatever. So here we are, chapter seven, um, beginning at verse 16-ish. Hmm, well, I'll start at verse 14. And the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hard. He refuses to send off the people. Go to Pharaoh in the morning. Look, he will be going out to the water, and you shall be poised to meet him on the bank of the Nile. And the staff that turned into a snake you shall take in your hand. And you shall say to him, The Lord, God of the Hebrews, sent me to you, saying, Send off my people, that they may worship me in the wilderness. And look, you have not heeded as yet. Thus said the Lord, By this you shall know that I am the Lord. Look, I am about to strike with the staff in my hand on the water that is in the Nile, and it will turn into blood. And the fish that are in the Nile will die, and the Nile will stink, and the Egyptians will not be able to drink water from the Nile. And the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their rivers, and over their Nile channels, and over their ponds, and over all the gathering of their waters, that they become blood. And there shall be blood in all the land of Egypt, and in the trees, and in the stones. And Moses and Aaron did thus as the Lord had charged. And he raised the staff and struck the water that was in the Nile before the eyes of Pharaoh and the eyes of his servants, and all the water that was in the Nile turned to blood. And the fish that were in the Nile died, and the Nile stunk, and the Egyptians could not drink water from the Nile, and the blood was in all the land of Egypt. And the soothsayers of Egypt did thus with their spells, and Pharaoh's heart hardened, and he did not heed them, just as the Lord had spoken. And Pharaoh turned and came into his house, and this too he did not take to heart. And all of Egypt dug round the Nile for water to drink, for they could not drink the water of the Nile. So that's quite the first pass at a plague for all of the running water and all of the lakes to be turned into blood. And the people are having to dig for groundwater in order to find anything to drink because they can't drink the water in the river. I think this would be terrible and disgusting. Um, I'm not a big fan of blood as it is, but Pharaoh apparently thinks that it'll pass. Um, he's clearly not the best leader for his people, but nonetheless, there he is. And so that's the very beginning of the 10 plagues is that all the water is undrinkable. This is a fascinating situation, don't you think? That Moses is standing on the banks of the Nile at the very place where he was rescued from death. So the Nile was in Egypt, the source of life, of course, without it and its yearly floods, there would be no agriculture and no ability to live in the desert there. But people use it for drinking, for washing, for cooking, for cleaning, for um, agriculture. And then Pharaoh turned it into a source of death for the Hebrews by insisting that baby boys be tossed in. Moses was floated in and drawn out by Pharaoh's own daughter. And then, now, Moses stands on the banks of the Nile with Pharaoh himself and turns the river again from life to death. It's quite an achievement, but apparently the magicians can do the same, so Pharaoh doesn't care. He doesn't take this as a sign from God. Something similar happens with the future plagues. We get the plague where frogs come up everywhere and um, it's gross. Wolf. And again, the soothsayers can do something similar. And so, meh. And then it's lice everywhere. Ugh. Again, like I feel itchy just thinking about it. And um, this is the moment when something fascinating happens. So on the third 
plague. Now we're in chapter 8, verse 14. It says, or verse 13, it says, Aaron stretched out his hand with his staff and struck the dust of the land, and there were lice in man and beast. All the dust of the land became lice in all the land of Egypt. And thus the soothsayers of Egypt did with their spells to take out the lice, but they were unable. So for all of the previous signs, the magicians replicated the sign, but this time they tried to undo it and they couldn't. And that was the beginning of the end, really. The soothsayers even said to Pharaoh, this is God. But Pharaoh didn't listen to his own people either. So just as he wasn't listening to Moses and Aaron, he also was not listening to his own magicians and courtiers. We get then um, the next set of plagues. Again, Moses goes to meet Pharaoh by the water, so on the banks of the Nile. And there is a horde of insects that comes next. And then further on, um, the livestock all die. And then there's boils. It gets grosser by the minute, really. It's not clear how long all these plagues take, like if it was sort of one a week or one a year or who knows, but it seems to go on for quite a long time. We end up then with hail that destroys all of the crops. And then if there were any crops left, we get locusts who eat everything. So they probably even eat all of the things that were smashed by the hail. It even says every grass of the land and every fruit of the tree that the hail had left, nothing was left when the locusts were done. Then there was darkness so thick you could feel it. And it says, Moses stretched out his hand over the heavens and there was pitch dark in all the land of Egypt for three days. No one saw his fellow and no one rose from where he was three days but all the Israelites had light in their dwelling places. And Moses then is summoned to Pharaoh and Pharaoh says, go and worship the Lord. Only your sheep and cattle will be set aside. Even your children can go with you. So you may remember that when Joseph and his brothers and their family went up to bury Jacob, they left behind the children and the flocks and the herds in part as sort of surety that they would come back. And Moses was insisting that they all had to go, the children and the flocks and the herds, and Pharaoh was not into that. So finally he allows that the children can go, but not the flocks and herds, and Moses refuses. And then we come to the last plague, the one that is perhaps the most horrifying, although they've all been horrifying, and they would all have resulted in grief, in death, in loss, in horror. But now we come to the one where um, the firstborn of everything in the land is going to die, except in the part of the country where the Israelites live. And so it says in chapter 12 that at midnight, the Lord struck down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh sitting on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and every firstborn of the beasts. And Pharaoh rose at night, he and all his servants and all Egypt, and there was a great outcry in Egypt, for there was no household in which there was no dead. And he called to Moses and to Aaron at night and said, Rise, go out from the midst of my people, both you and the Israelites, and go worship the Lord as you have spoken. Both your sheep and your cattle take as you have spoken and go, and you shall bless me as well. It's a bit of an imperious command, bless me as well, after all that they have been through. But nonetheless, on they go. So they go out from Egypt, and we'll talk about that part either tomorrow or Friday. But I just wanted us to get an overview because we talk a lot about the 10 plagues, but I think we forget sometimes what they were and just how awful they would be to live through. So there is here a great 
irony <laughs> that the people were in the people of Egypt were enslaving the Israelites and then they suffer greatly at the hands of their leader who refuses to make people free and the freedom that the Israelites eventually gain comes at a great cost not to them but to others and I think we need to be aware that even though this is an epic story that we can base our whole Christian story on even, um, and that Jews still celebrate today, that even in the midst of the Passover celebration, there is still mourning. We recognize that um, there was pain and loss involved in this. And just as Pharaoh's daughter brought the Hebrew child into her house, refusing to see a distinction that her father insisted on, I think it behooves us to refuse to see those distinctions as well, that we, um, that we make an effort to be together, that we see one another for all that we are and all the experiences that we have, including the griefs that are visited upon our fellow human beings. It's not an unmitigated celebration when freedom comes. There, there is grief involved in that and it matters that we care about the griefs of others because then, even if they are the griefs of our oppressors, because when we care about the griefs of others, then we are better able to become the full body of Christ. We're better able to build a full kingdom of God when we see the grief and the pain that leaders have inflicted in pursuit of their own ego. We don't need... <laughs> We just don't need to be like those leaders. And I think recognizing that all of us suffer at their hands is one way that we can then begin to care for each other. So while I won't excuse in any way the poor behavior of the Egyptians, they followed Pharaoh's orders and they were awful to their neighbors. But that does not make it okay for them to be victimized by their own leaders either. So let's maybe work toward a world where we don't have leaders that serve their own ego instead of their people. Perhaps we can work toward a world where we care enough about our neighbors to call them into a different way of being rather than emulating those leaders. We can choose to behave differently together in community. And while that might or might not have saved the Egyptians in the moment, it certainly would make a difference to the ways that we live together today. We do not have to keep playing out this same story over and over again, where one person's liberation requires the destruction of another. We can, if some of us are willing to give up our own ego and our own privileges, we can find liberation for all of us together. So that is what I hope we will learn from the story of the plagues. And then tomorrow or Friday, depending on how the schedule goes, um, we will hear about what comes next as they head out away from the cities. So having said all of that, let's take a moment to pray together now. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this day that you have made and for the community of your people that you have called together. We are so different and we have so many different experiences and expectations, and yet you call us to be family with one another. Help us to rejoice with those who rejoice and to weep with those who weep. 
remind us of the truth that our liberation is bound up in that of our neighbor. Give us courage to call forth our best selves, the people that you have called us to be, both from ourselves and from others, that together we may discover the fullness of your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Right? I hope you have a delightful evening ahead, and I will see you again soon. Cheers, and peace be with you.